we looked at uh, God encountering Moses at the burning bush. And we entitled this teaching, Silencing the Voice of Failure. Now, just a quick review of what we talked about last week. God was seeking to relieve some fears that Moses had. And he was seeking to silence a voice that Moses had been listening to for 40 years. It's what we're calling the voice of failure. You remember the story of the burning bush? We'll read a part of the text in a moment, a part of that story. But one of the things that happened at that encounter of the burning bush is there was Moses at the burning bush, and God calls him to be the deliverer. And Moses starts making excuses on into chapter 4. And he says, well, I can't talk. I'm not eloquent of speech. We saw last week that that absolutely was not true. In Acts chapter 7, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in verse 22, uh, we read Stephen talking about the history of Israel, and he talks about Moses, and he says, Moses was mighty in word and in deed back when he was in Egypt. Wait a minute, you were mighty in word and deed, now you say you can't talk. We, we covered all this last week, but anyway, that was the voice of failure speaking to Moses. You're no good. You failed. You blew it. God can't use you. You can't do anything. That voice of failure. And so now at the burning bush, God is calling him again. Here's what we talked about real quickly last week. We talked about God's answer to Moses when he said, I am that I am. And we called God the outside of time God. Moses asked two questions. Who am I that I should go? God never answered that question. He just said, I'll be with you. The only thing you need to know is that I'll be with you. You don't need to know anything about yourself other than that I will be with you. Well, then, when I appear before the children of Israel and they ask me, what's the name of the God that sent you? What should I tell them? And God said, tell them, I am that I am. We talked about that last week, the eternal present one, the, the one who stands outside of time, the one who shows a bush that's on fire but not being consumed. It's as if time was suspended at that bush. Why is that important? Because God stands outside of time, and even though he has called you, he's put a dream in your heart, he's put a desire in your heart, he already knew about your failure at the time he called you, and he already knew about your failure, and he still called you. Your failure has not eliminated God's work in your life. Your failure has not voided out God's purpose for your life. God, your failure has not removed God's call from your life. God is the outside of time God. And so we return back to this passage today. And keep in mind, Moses is still struggling after 40 years with failure. Having trouble believing that God could use him. And many of us struggle with that same thing. We just have trouble believing that God could use us. We believe he could use somebody else, but not us. Why? We failed. We don't have it. We fall short. We tried that once. And so God comes to Moses again at a burning bush. And the answer of God to Moses is the answer to our fears. We'll talk about that this week and next week. And the answer of God to Moses is the silencing of that voice of failure. Well, let's read about it. We pick up the story of what we read last week in chapter 3 of Exodus, beginning with verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So God said, I will certainly be with you. Notice he didn't answer the question, who am I? He just said, I'm going to tell you that I'll be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. Notice verse 15. This is my name forever. 
This is my memorial unto all generations. I want all people to know me as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He had already said that title in verse uh, 6 of chapter 3, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now, if you want to get really deep in theology, you talk about I am. But if you want to be real practical, you talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One thing before I get into what this could possibly mean and how it could relieve the fears of Moses and how it could silence that voice of, of failure, uh, just one side note, and that is God desires to be known by what he does in his people. God desires to reveal who he is by what he does in his people. Well, Lord, they're going to question me. They're going to want to know who is who's the God that's sending you after all. Moses went to them 40 years before saying that God had sent him, and that all fell apart. And now if you're wanting me to go again, they're going to ask, well, who's sending you? What should I tell them? Well, tell them the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. In other words, God said, you tell them I am the same God that worked in these people they know about. They know about Abraham. They know about Isaac. They know about Jacob. They know about these people. Tell them I am the God that worked in these men's lives. God wants to be known by what he does in the lives of his people. God wants to be known by what he does in your life. Wouldn't it be great to just put your name right in there? I am the God of Tony. That's how, that's how I want people to know. I'm that God. I'm the God of Scott. I'm the God of Mark. I'm the God of Grace. And you tell them, this is who I am. Look at what I've done in that person's life. That's who I am. And so we should live that way, shouldn't we? Lord, help me to live so that people will know who you are by what you're doing in my life. God wants to be known by what he does in his people. But God zeroes in now on three men. Now they are the patriarchs of Israel, so all of Israel would know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the father. God is the father of this nation that needs delivering. And God is basically saying, I'm not going to abandon my child. I am the God of the patriarchs. I am the creator of this nation. But in order for our fears to be relieved and our silencing of the voice of failure, we need to ask some questions about who is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and what did God do in their life? And, and how is it that God identifying with these people can somehow help us? Well, I want to jump into that. And you, if you have a study guide that you got it in the foyer, you can sneak out and get one real quick. If you didn't get one, there's some fill in the blanks. Here's number one, the God of Abraham. Who is the God of Abraham? Knowing who the God of Abraham is, is a part of silencing the voice of failure. For 40 years, Moses has been listening to the voice of failure, thinking that God couldn't possibly use him. God's going to put an end to that. And don't you dare leave this building today thinking that God can't use you. He's the God of Abraham. And God wants you to leave this place today knowing that you don't have to listen to the voice of failure anymore that you are just as called today as you were 10 years ago or wherever it was, whenever it was before your failure, before you let it drift, before you let go of it, you're just as called today as you were then. I am the God of Abraham. Well, who is the God of Abraham? First of all, write this in that first blank. The God of Abraham is the God of miracles. The God of Abraham is the God of miracles. You know the story by just the basics of the story of Abraham. God, God called him when he was 75 years old to be the father of a nation, and yet his wife was barren. His wife could not have children, and, and he's already 75. And, and then when he's 100 years old, God opens the womb of his 90-year-old wife. How many of you would say, I think that might be in the category of a miracle? A 90-year-old woman and a 100-year-old guy, and they're going to have a healthy baby that just might at least be on the fringe of being called a miracle. The supernatural. That which somehow God suspends the natural course of things and intervenes. And, and the God of Abraham is the God of miracles. Now, there are two notable things in Abraham's life that we associate him with. Number one, that having that child, Isaac, when he was 100 years old and his wife was 90, that's a miracle. And then when he took that child up to Mount Moriah in Genesis 22, and he was believing that God could raise him from the dead. That took a lot of faith, didn't it? 
And God provided on that day. Jehovah Jireh, that's where we get that name from, Jehovah Jireh. So the God of Abraham is the God of miracles. But how do miracles happen? Miracles happen in response to faith. So let's talk about faith. Miracles happen in response to faith. Now, why is this important to Moses? See, I think, and now I'm going to read into it a little bit. You see what you think. I think Moses had a bit of an issue when it comes to the power of God and the supernatural of God. Remember, 40 years ago, Acts chapter 7, verse 25, it says, For he supposed that they would understand that by his hand God would deliver them. See, Moses was a great military leader in Egypt. We know this from history. Moses was a great orator. And I believe what Moses was thinking was, I'm going to go down there to Egypt. I'm going to reveal myself to those people. I'll just talk to them like I've talked to the masses before. They know who I am. They know I'm a great leader. And I will lead them out. And I will be their deliverer. Notice the phrase, he supposed that they would know that by his hand. See, was he looking for anything supernatural to happen, or did he think he would do it? He was a great leader. He was mighty in word and deed. He thought they would understand that by his hand, God would deliver them. Whose hand is it going to be, Moses? Is it going to be your hand, or is it going to be God's hand? Whatever it is you're called to do by God, whose strength is it that's going to make it happen? Your strength or God's strength? Whose hand? Your hand or God's hand? And Moses, in his time of still listening to that voice of failure at the burning bush, he, he, he offers excuses up to God. I can't talk. And notice what God says. And this is all in chapter 4. He says, well, who made man's mouth? Because you need to look to me. I'm the creator. I'm the God who does miracles. And then look at chapter 4. Look at chapter 4. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared unto you. Why would Moses be thinking that? Maybe because 40 years before, they doubted him and didn't believe in him. He failed. So the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? Isn't that interesting, that play on words of hand? He thought that they would understand 40 years ago that by his hand, God would deliver them. Now God says, by the way, Moses, what is in your hand? Well, a rod, a stick, a staff. Throw it down. So he throws it down, and it becomes a snake. Now that's, how many of you would say that's a miracle? All right. And then God says, pick it up by the tail. People trying to analyze the text said, oh, well, yeah, that's the proper way to pick up a snake. There is no proper way to pick up a snake. If you need a snake, if you meet a snake, if you see a snake, you only have two options, shoot or run. But you don't pick it up. And so God said, pick it up by the tail. Pick it up by the tail. And, and he reaches down. <laughs> now, this is, this is either supernatural or crazy. Because he reaches down and he grabs that snake by the tail and becomes a stick again. God did something supernatural with what was in Moses' hand. Why? He wanted Moses to get the point. It's my power in your hand, not yours. I'm the God who does the impossible. Yes, I'll do it through your hand, but it's not your power. It's not your strength. What's in your hand, Moses? What's in your hand? Now notice what else God did with the hand of Moses. Remember the story? He said, Moses, you take your hand, stick it inside your garment now. And so he stuck his hand inside his garment. Now pull it out. He pulled it out, and it was leprous. I mean, he looks at his hand, and it is leprous. It's, and the flesh is rotting away. And he says, stick it back in. And he sticks it back in, pull it out, and now it's clean. Why was God doing these tricks with his hand? Because at one point in time, Moses thought it was by his own hand that he would the people would understand that he was their deliverer. No, it's not by your hand, Moses. It's by what I do through your hand. It's my power. You've got to believe in the supernatural. You've got to believe that, that that which is going to happen is beyond the normal. It's not by just your hand. It's by what I do with your hand. It's the hand of God. 
And it's a fascinating study. We don't have time to get into it today, but I would encourage you just to trace through the Scripture the phrase, hand of God. In the New Testament, you'll read about the, the, the church at Antioch, for example, in Acts 11. It says, and the hand of the Lord was upon them. And many believed supernatural things were happening because the hand of the Lord was upon them. How did Ezra do that great work of rebuilding the, the temple and returning the people to a, a, a foreign land? It says, by the good hand of the Lord was upon me. The hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord. Re study that out in the scripture. About John the Baptist, what will this child be? Luke 1, For the hand of the Lord was with him. All throughout the scripture we see this phrase, hand of the Lord. It speaks of the power of God overriding human power. Not just human power, but the power of God overriding human power. That's what Moses needed to know. It was never supposed to be about your power, Moses. On into the New Testament, we read things like, my, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So what's in your hand, Moses? Let me show you the supernatural. Well, let me show you the impossible. If you just yield to me whatever is in your hand. Now let's read about Abraham and miracles. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, kind of summing up his life. Romans uh, chapter 4. The God of Abraham is the God of miracles. So if we believe in the God of Abraham, we believe in miracles. We believe that anything can happen. God can do anything. We read in chapter 4 of Romans verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. All right, we're asking the question, who's Abraham? Who's the God of Abraham? Well, Abraham is the father of faith. So this whole thing has something to do with faith. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believes so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Why did uh, Abraham meet the God of miracles? Why did Abraham experience the supernatural? It's because he had faith. Now, we would all agree that if only I had faith, everything's possible. Jesus said that, didn't he? Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. If you just have faith like a grain of mustard seed, just a tiny bit of faith, nothing will be impossible to you if you only have just a little bit of faith. Why, what overcomes the world? 1 John chapter 5, 1 through 5. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So if, if faith opens up all the possibilities of God, remember Mary, when, when she was told she's going to have this miraculous birth, again, supernatural miracle, she said, how can this be? Well, with God, nothing is impossible. But blessed is she that believeth that there will be a performance of the things spoken to her. She had to have faith. Yes, there is the impossible. There are miracles. There is the supernatural intervention of God. But somehow it's tied together with faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not yet seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. By faith, you read Hebrews chapter 11. All these incredible things happen. By faith. And we all believe that. We, we all affirm that. If, if only I had faith, I could be like Hudson Taylor and, and without any support, take the gospel where it's never been. I could be like George Mueller without any income. I could care for hundreds of orphans. I could be like Curran Thomas and hear the voice of God, go north, get off the train here, and see a thousand churches birthed out of that obedience. I could be like some of these great men of old. You read about Smith Wigglesworth and the incredible miracles he saw. I said, if only I had faith, I could be like that. But what's the difference? There's something gnawing away at us saying, yeah, but you don't have that kind of faith. Yeah, what if you step out and try to do something for God and then it's revealed you really don't have that kind of faith? That's the voice of failure speaking. 
And that's a fear that all of us, if we were honest, I believe all of us would wrestle with this fear that, yeah, I know that faith makes everything possible, and I know that with faith God can do incredible things. But what if I don't have faith? What if my faith falters? What if, I, what if there's a flaw in my faith? See, that's a voice of failure, and that's a fear. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. I want to show you something about, about Moses. There was a time early in Moses' life that he had incredible faith. There was a time even long before the burning bush that Moses had a faith that is admirable, that, that we look at we say, wow, what faith, that is incredible faith. And then he failed. And God had to bring him back to faith again. Let's look at it real closely. I want, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to it. So I want you to look at the words right in front of you. We're going to kind of break down this text, and, and we're going to try and put this text in its historical setting. When were the events God's talking about? Look at, uh, talking about Moses uh, in verse 23, it's about his parents' faith. But look at uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, he's about 40 years old now, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When is that in the story of Moses? That's Exodus chapter 2. When it came into his mind, to go down and visit his brethren, the Hebrew slaves. At that point, he knew he was their deliverer, and he knew God wanted to use him to deliver those people. And notice what he did, by faith. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, he made a choice, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Notice what this is saying. It's saying that at that moment in time, Moses realized, wait a minute, I'm a, I'm a grown man, 40 years old. I'm of age. I've been groomed to take over the throne of Egypt. I am, I'm being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But I know who I am. I am no slave's deliverer. And he made a choice. He said, I will give up all of the sinful pleasures of Egypt, and I will give up all the treasures of Egypt, and I will go and I will identify with these slaves, and I will be their deliverer, and God will reward me. That's what it says. He looked for the reward. That took a lot of faith, didn't it? Don't you admire that commitment, saying, I'm going to give all this up to go be their deliverer? He had faith. The Bible says Moses, at that point in time, Exodus 2, when he went down to the children of Israel, he had faith. But how'd that work out for him? It didn't. Somehow he failed. Somehow he blew it. Now, I'm going to really speculate here, but I wonder if God is like a lot of us, if God is like me, if Moses, rather, is like me, if Moses is like a lot of us, if Moses would have been thinking, God, you let me down. I gave this all up to go identify with these people and I made my move and they were supposed to recognize that I would be their great leader and by my hand you would deliver them and they didn't get it, Lord. Remember what happened? How he killed that Egyptian who was, who was abusing uh, a Hebrew and then he buried him in the sand. The next day he went down there again and he saw two Hebrews fighting and they did not acknowledge him as their deliverer. They said, are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? And Moses then quick hit the panic button and he ran away in fear. Why? He would made this great commitment and it didn't work the way he thought it would work. Let me just interject something here and it's just an, an observation of mine. Beware. Beware of preconceived ideas of how you think God is going to work. Be aware. That's a danger, er, dangerous area. When we, in our own mind, we, we have it all figured out. Okay, I'm going to do this for God, and then God's going to do that for me. Notice Moses was looking for the reward. He said, I'm going to do this for God, and God's going to reward me, and it didn't happen. You know what I found? And we all have this tendency to want to speculate and then we imagine in our mind, well, I'm, God's going to do this and then God's going to do that and then God's going to do this and it all falls apart. No, be very careful about preconceived ideas about how God is going to do something. Just let him do what he does. Don't try and figure out the details of how he's going to do it. Just obey him. And it very well could be that Moses, when he saw they were rejecting him, that Moses walked away from that encounter thinking, well, God, I must have either missed your voice or somehow you let me down or this wasn't real. 
and he spent 40 years listening to the voice of failure. Now God calls him again. God calls him back to faith. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, still in our text, and let's pick up this, this narration of no, Moses. Look at verse 27. Ask yourself, when is this talking about? Verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch him. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. It's talking about the Exodus. So he says he had faith when he went down to try to be their deliverer. When he chose to identify with them, he had faith. And now he has faith 40 years later. He has faith again. What happened in between? Failure. The voice of failure. You know what I like about this? And please forgive me. I'm, I know I'm using my speculation. I try to just stick to what the word says. But sometimes you've got to kind of look at it and, and use your mind a little bit. I say, wait a minute. Why is it that God talks about the faith he had when he left Pharaoh's daughter and then the faith he had at the Exodus and God doesn't say anything about the in-between? Maybe God is not as hung up on your failure as you are. Maybe God doesn't think about your failure as much as you think about your failure. Maybe why that was no big deal to God to leave that part out in the narrative of, of Hebrews chapter 11. Because he was only trying to highlight faith. He was only trying to highlight the finished product. I believe it is true that you and I are far more hung up on our failure than God is. You and I are listening to that voice of failure, and it's not God's voice. When God talks about Moses, he talks about the faith he had when he made that commitment to leave Egypt and forsake it all to follow the people of God. And then he talks about the faith he had again 40 years later. In other words, we need to overcome that 40-year gap of failure. We need to overcome that and get back to faith. I really can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. I have daydreams of what I want to do for God. Do you? Don't you think about revival? Don't you think about miracles? Don't you think about healings? Don't you think about churches exploding with new people getting saved and put back together? And I mean, I love to daydream about all that. And I know all that is possible if only we have faith. But what if I don't have that kind of faith? What if I'm just a failure in the area of faith? I can think of some things in my life I tried before and they didn't work. That's the voice of failure. Main point number two in your outline, who is the God of Abraham? Number one was he's the God of miracles. But the God of Abraham is the author of faith. The story of Abraham, we like to highlight the miracles. We like to highlight when Isaac is born. And we like to highlight when he took Isaac up on the mountain and, and was going to sacrifice him. And God stopped him and, and gave his own sacrifice. We love to tell the highlights of Abraham's life. But faith in Abraham was a 25-year process. The story of Abraham is actually a journey filled with failure. No, I'm not here to pick on Abraham. He's the father of faith. But when you, when you read what the whole of the Bible says about the life of Abraham and how God worked in the life of Abraham, you, you come to the conclusion there's a lot of failure in Abraham. Let me just cite a few, just so you know that, that Abraham failed. By the way, if you have any faith at all, give God the glory. He was the author of it. And, and, and sometimes we question, we say, God, well, what if I don't have enough faith? God says, that's okay, I'm the author of faith. See, we need, we need something about who we are and just rejoice in the fact that he's with us. God is with us. And he is the God of Abraham, who is the God of miracles, and he's also the author of our faith. In Genesis chapter 11, and then comparing it with Acts 7, uh, we see here's one failure. When God appeared first, to Abraham, it says in Acts 7, he was in Ur of the Chaldeans. But then many years later, we pick up the story in Genesis 11 and 12, and he's in a place called Haran. Now, if you look at a map, Ur of the Chaldees is down in the southeastern corner uh, of the map. If you look at the Euphrates River, and, and Haran is up to the northwest. 
In other words, God appeared to him when he was down in Ur of the Chaldees, and God said, leave your land and leave your family and go into a land that I will show you. And if you see the journey of Abraham, here's what he did. He never crossed the river. He kept going along the bank of the Euphrates, wherever it took him, farther north, farther north, farther north, until the far northern end of that, there's this great city called Iran, and there he settled for several years. He never crossed the river. God said, leave this land. He never left it. Why? Well, I'm only speculating again, but I, I believe he wanted to stay close to the river. If he was like I am, I like to stay close to the river so that if something goes wrong, I can find my way back. He stayed close to the river because as long as he was close to the river, he knew how to get home. But God said, leave your home to a land that I will show you. And he never for many years left the river. We also know that Haran was pretty much uh, the same kind of city as Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, we see in, in archaeology that in all of the findings of that region about that period of time, there were two cities that seemed to be really prosperous, Ur of the Chaldees and Iran. Why? They've discovered indoor plumbing there. That meant they were prosperous. They worshiped the same God, the sun God. In other words, he stayed in the familiar. He stayed in his comfort zone. And we're not picking on him because we pretty much do the same thing. We want to serve God, but we want to stay close to the river. We want, to, we want to make sure we can get back. We want to serve God, but we don't want to give up any of our comfort. We, we want to stay in our comfort zone as we serve God. And God said, I want you to leave all this. What else did God say? Leave your family. Genesis chapter 7 as well as Acts, uh, Genesis 12. And Acts 7 says, leave your country. And, and we read about, about it in, in Genesis 12. God said, leave your family. Kindred, leave your country, leave your family. And then verse 4 says, so he took Lot with him. Well, wait a minute, you're supposed to leave your family. But you took Lot with you. And you read the story of Lot, and all Lot did was sidetrack Abraham over and over again. Strife between their, their servants. And then, and then Lot gets taken prisoner of war, and Abraham's got to go fight a war to get him back. Then the whole Sodom Gomorrah story. I mean, Lot was a continual sidetracking of the journey of Abraham. And God said, don't take your family. And so he took Lot. All of that. Then in chapter 12, Genesis, there was a detour into Egypt. There was a famine. Notice what God said, I want you to go into land that I will show you. He never showed him to go to Egypt, but, but, but Abraham went down there anyway. What's the first thing he does when he gets there? He gets afraid. They're gonna, his wife is beautiful. He said, don't tell them you're my wife. They might kill me to get you. Just, we'll tell them you're my sister. So Pharaoh took Sarah away to have as a part of his little harem. Why, you are you really messing up big time there, Abraham? Because God said, you're going to be the father of a nation. You're letting your wife go with another man. God had his hand on that. God protected her from that. But here's something else. There's a little phrase. It says, Pharaoh treated Abraham really well because of Sarah, and he gave him cattle and livestock and male servants and female servants. And one of those female servants was named Hagar. Ring a bell. And in Gen Genesis chapter 16, another failure of Abraham. Uh, they are so discouraged because they can't have a kid. And so Sarah said, well, 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 here, take this young girl. She's healthy. She can have a baby. Take Hagar. And Ishmael is born. And you know how that turned out. It's failure. Here's something that maybe we miss all too easily. Genesis 16, 16 and Genesis 17, 1. There is a gap of 13 years where God was silent. After Hagar and Ishmael, God is silent for 13 years. And then God appears unto him again. 13 years go by. Here's what I'm trying to emphasize to you. Faith was a 25-year process for Abraham. And God was the one that was constantly intervening and constantly calling him back and constantly trying to build his faith. God is the author of Abraham's faith. The voice of failure says to us, what if I don't have faith? And God says, that's all right, I'm the author of faith. Just walk with me. Just let me work in your life. I can produce it. Just walk with me. Do you see how very patient God is with Abraham? Time and time again, God is, is working with Abraham to build his faith. At one point, he says, Abraham, look at the stars. Look at the dust. Look at the sand. Your descendants are going to be more numerous than the stars, than the sand, than the dust. 
So everywhere Abraham went, he was given a reminder of the promise. God was trying to build his faith. At another point, God said, change your name to Abraham. Change your name to Sarah so you'd be speaking in faith. God was trying to build his faith. Many times in many different ways throughout the whole 25 years of this journey to faith, God was intervening. One night, he fell, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and God cut covenant with him in a pillar of fire just to try and build his faith. When Abraham finally got to the place of having faith, you know whose credit that was that he had faith? It wasn't his own credit. He'd blown it many times. He'd failed many times. But the God of Abraham is the author of faith. And if you're, if you're not serving God because you fear, well, I might get in the middle of this thing and I might not have enough faith. He's the author of your faith. Look to him. And what does Hebrews 12 tell us? Hebrews 12 says, looking unto Jesus, the author of our faith. And that Greek word for our, our author there is archigos, and arch meaning the, the commencement, the beginning. Egos means the one who brings it forth. And those who are saying, I am the one that will bring forth faith in your life. I am the one that will speak in your life. I am the one that will quicken it in your life. Just walk with me. Stop focusing on who you are. A lot of people, they brag about their faith. And you know what? I, I really question if it's genuine faith or it's just something they manufactured. Faith is a result of a process of God working in your life. Just like he did Abraham. Who is the God of Abraham? He is the God who is the author of our faith. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. John 6, 29. We want to do the works of God. Well, this is the work of God that you believe. It's God's work that you believe. We can't even take credit for our own faith. If it's genuine faith, it's because God has been at work in our life. So stop listening to the voice of failure that says, Oh, you won't have enough faith for that. If you try that, you won't have enough faith. Here's the answer to that voice. No, but God is the author of faith. And at the point in time when I need that kind of faith, I've got to believe that God will author that kind of faith. That if God has called me, God will work within me. It's all about Him, not about me. He's the God of Abraham. He's the author of faith. Mark eleven twenty two, that famous passage where Jesus cursed the fig tree and and then they come along and say, wow, look at that tree. Lord. And basically what they're saying is, Jesus, how did you do that? And he said, have faith in God. But that's in what's called the genitive. It can mean have faith in God, or it can mean have the faith of God, or it can mean have the faith that comes from God. I believe it's all three. Genuine faith is in God, but genuine faith also is from God. Genuine faith is God's kind of faith. Where does your faith come from? It, it, does it come because you're so spiritual that you somehow manufacture your own faith? You're going to fail. No, faith comes from God. He's the author of faith. Yes, read the word. Yes, hear the word. Yes, walk with God. Do all the things you're supposed to be doing. But it's God who produces the faith. Who is the God of Abraham? He's the author of faith. Don't you be afraid. Don't be afraid to step out for God. Because you might be thinking, well, I, I think I have faith, but if I step out, I might not have. But wait a minute, he's the author of faith. He'll work in you. Just let him work. Who am I? Who am I? Doesn't matter who you are. I'm with you, he says. I'm with you. Just like I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of miracles, and I am the author of faith. Last point, number three. The God of Abraham is also the perfecter of faith. It says in Romans chapter 4 that, that Abraham was fully persuaded. It's in your study guide, that word. But that word fully persuaded means to be brought to full measure. In other words, God worked in his life to bring his faith up to that full measure. He was not weak in faith, but he was strengthened in faith. Who strengthened him? God. Who's going to bring your faith up to full measure? Who's going to strengthen your faith? God. He's the author, and he's the finisher of faith. Again, quoting Hebrews 12, 2, the author and finisher of our faith, looking unto Jesus. The word for finisher or perfecter is teleotes, which means to bring something to the end for which it was designed. God says, I'm going to plant a seed of faith in your heart, and then I will work in your heart, and I will work in your life to bring that faith to its designed end. 
I not only will author that faith or be the, the beginning of your faith, I will mature your faith. I will perfect your faith. I will work to develop your faith. What is more precious than gold that, tri- that, that, that perishes in the fire, that is tried in the fire, rather? What is more precious than that? Your faith tried. Who does the trying? God. He's the author, the perfecter of faith. Using a different word because it's Hebrew, but in, in Psalms 138.8 we read, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me, for your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. You know that you are the work of God's hands? He's not going to forsake the work of his hands. He will perfect that which concerns you. He will work to bring it to full measure. He will work to bring it to maturity. Philippians chapter 1, 6, I'm confident this very thing, that he who has begun, he authored something in you, he's begun a good work in you, will continue it until that day. He'll perfect it until that day. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is the author and the perfecter of faith? And so why are you afraid to live by faith? God's the one who authors it. God's the one who perfects it. Just let him work. Just yield to him. It's not our own efforts even producing faith. I love the story of that man. And you and I, as parents, we can under, understand a little bit what this guy was going through. His son was, was demonized. And these demons were trying to destroy this boy, throwing him in the fire, throwing him in the water to drown. He came to the disciples of Jesus, and they couldn't help him. So he comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, Do you believe? I love the honesty of his answer. I believe. Help my unbelief. You ever felt that way? I do believe, but Lord, I, I question whether I can really pull this off, this faith thing. Did Jesus kick him out? Did Jesus say, oh, well, then you, your kid's going to be demonized forever until he's killed? No, Jesus did a miracle. Maybe you and I need to say, Lord, I believe. In other words, you've planted a seed of faith in me, but I need you to develop it. I need you to perfect the faith that you've, you've somehow given birth or authored in me. Do not be afraid to live by faith when you understand it is God who authors faith and it is God who matures or perfects faith. All you and I have to do is just walk with Him. Just yield to Him. Let Him do it. He's the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. One last analogy before we close. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. It's a very, very familiar story. It's a story of Peter walking on the water. Now, now I just want to give you a quick test, and you know it's probably a trick question. So your, your temptation is going to be, in your mind, you're going to answer the opposite of what you really would have answered. But when I, when I mention Peter walking on the water, does that come into your mind as a, a failure or a success? Well, he's, oh, he looked at the wind, he looked at the waves, he sank. Well, that's one way to look at it. I choose to look at it another way. How many people do you know that took any steps on water? You know, when, when they got back in the boat, do you, think, do you think knowing what we know about Peter, do you think maybe he looked at his buddies in the boat and says, hey, guys, don't laugh at me. How many steps did you take? Three, four, I took, how many did he take? Three, four, five. If he took any at all, that's more than the rest of humanity combined. But see, our mindset is we usually think on the negative. Well, let's read this story. There's there's a really, really interesting insight to be gained from this story. Matthew chapter 14, and and, and we pick it up in in, uh, verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves. The wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Well, it was Jesus. So he said, come. And when Peter had gotten, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He walked on the water. By the way, the Wright brothers, how many of you know who the Wright brothers were? Fathers of aviation, right? So, oh, they invented the airplane. Kind of, yeah. 
how many how many feet did they fly? Did they fly from here to Seattle? Did they fly from here to Indio? No, they flew a matter of a few feet. But at that point in time, they flew farther than any other man had ever flown. They proved it could be done. I don't know how far Peter walked on the water, but he walked on the water. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. The word sink means, literally in the Greek, it means according to the sea. In other words, you just don't walk on the water. According to the sea, you're going to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now notice that phrase, O ye of little faith. Now the word for faith is pistos. P-I-S-T-O-S. Pistos. It's the word faith. The word uh, for unbelief is ah, pistos. Those not having faith. No faith. But that's not the word Jesus used. Jesus used a word, it's only used about four times uh, in the words of Jesus, Holy Ghost Pistos. It uses the word faith, and it puts this little uh, beginning on Holy Ghost. And Holy Ghost means puny, or underdeveloped, or undergrown. Jesus didn't say, Peter, you don't have any faith. He said, your faith hasn't grown enough. What just happened, Peter, demonstrated that you have some faith, but it needs to grow some more. See, Jesus even saw it as a process. Did Peter drown? No. And neither will you. What did Jesus do? Now in my mind, and I always looked at this wrong over the years, in my mind I, I always saw Peter going under the water and Jesus reaching down and pulling him out. And so Peter's all wet and he's coughing and he's choking because he, he swallowed all this sea water, all this water. And, and Jesus holds him in his, heart, in his arms and Jesus walks on the water carrying Peter back to the boat. Just kind of flops him in the boat and says, Oh, ye of little faith. Why did you doubt? And the word doubt means torn in two ways. Why were you torn in two ways? You saw me walking on the water, you were walking on the water, and then you started focusing on the waves. You were torn in two ways. But I don't really believe that's the way it happened. Look at, look at what it says in verse 30. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, one hand, and caught him. Notice what it says about uh, about Peter in, in, in verse 30. It says, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and, does it say he sank? It says beginning to sink. It doesn't say he sank. He was only beginning to sink. How do you think he got back to the boat? What does your imagination tell you? What, sanctified imagination. How do you think he got back to the boat? Do you think he was coughing and spitting water and his hair was all wet and Jesus was carrying him? Here's the picture I, just based on what we just read, I think Jesus just reached out with one hand and grabbed a hold of him and hand in hand, they walked back to the boat. It makes sense to me. Because he said, your faith hasn't grown enough, Peter. You were, you were torn in two ways, you doubted. Because your faith, it's there, it just hasn't grown enough. And then Jesus, I believe, walked him back to the boat. I know it doesn't say that, but he grabbed him with just one hand. And they got back to the boat. Why am I, why am I emphasizing this? Because many of us have tried to do something for God and we've begun to, sunk, to sink. And we realize it's, it's our own lack of faith. And so we're afraid to try anything else again. But I want to remind you of something. You're still here. You didn't drown. He didn't, he didn't cast you off forever. He didn't send you to hell. He says, no, let me just take a hold of you. And let's walk this thing out together. Because I am not only the author of your faith, I'm the one who will perfect your faith. Just walk with me. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. That's what you and I should confess. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Abraham got to the place where he finally crossed the river and his adventure began again. Moses left the burning bush, put his sandals back on, and went down to the children of Israel with the rod in his hand, and his journey of faith began again. Peter was grabbed in the midst of his sinking and walked back to the boat, and his journey of faith began again. And today, your journey of faith 
can begin again. He hasn't cast you off. He hasn't canceled his call on your life. He hasn't voided out the dream, the desires that he put in your mind. He simply says, I'm the God of Abraham. All along you thought faith was a point in time, but the God of Abraham demonstrates us to us that faith is a process. And I'm with you. And I'll help you with this whole process of faith. Because who is the God of Abraham? Yes, he's the God of miracles. All things are possible. But he's the author of faith. He's the perfecter of faith. So take his hand and walk with him. And you will find at times you'll be walking in a realm of the supernatural. That's how he walks. Yes, you failed. But you can learn from your failure. Yes, Peter began to sink. But he walked. So will you. Not going to let you drown. He's going to lift you up. He didn't forsake Abraham. He worked with him for 25 years and more to bring it to pass. He'll do it in your life too. Let's stand together, shall we? And musicians, could we come? And we'll just begin to worship the Lord. I'm going to ask Pastor Matthew to come to close us in prayer. But while we're getting ready to worship, if you're here today or you're listening to this audio or video and you don't know Jesus Christ, let me just say, he has got, he's got a wonderful life for you. It's not going to be easy at times. It might even get harder for a while. But he's got a great life for you. But you need to yield to him. Right now, the Spirit of God has been knocking on the door of your, of your heart. And he's just saying, open up. Let me begin this journey of faith. Let me begin to put faith in your heart and develop faith in your life. Just walk with me. If you want to begin a walk with Jesus today, just pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Help me to learn to live by faith and be the author of faith in me. Be the perfecter of faith in me. For many of us, if not most of us, we've already received Jesus as our Savior and yet we need to stop listening to the voice of failure and start walking again and start believing again and, and start looking again to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and start trusting again the God of Abraham. He'll do it. That's who he is. So just recommit yourself to him. Just say, Lord, here I am. I'll walk with you again. I've been sinking for too long. I've been floundering for too long. Thank you that today you're grabbing me and you're taking me by the hand and we're beginning to walk again in the realm of the supernatural, in the realm of what you can do. Just yield to him. Follow him. Trust him. Hallelujah. Let's worship him and then Pastor Matthew will close us.